Okay, we're ready for the last talk of the day. Please welcome Anthony Shaw with uh, his talk, Write Faster Python with Common Performance Anti-Patterns. Big applause, please. Hey. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so my name's Anthony Shaw. Welcome to the Trampoline and Tumbling Championships, Regions 1 and 2. I hope everyone has got rid of their uh, stretches and everything, and it's all going well for you. So I'm um, probably not going to talk about that today. I will talk about writing faster Python. Um, there are parts of this talk which might cause some um, reactions from people in terms of the Pythonic or unpythonic code which is shown. So please save your questions for the end, um, as there are no questions. Uh, so um, if you haven't seen this talk, I really recommend you watch it. This is a talk by James Murphy he gave at PyCon last year. Uh, he wrote a NES em emulator in pure Python. And in the talk, uh, he basically presents his code. He shows the game not working. It gets to three frames a second uh, playing not that game, because that game is licensed, um, but playing a game similar to that. Um, and basically, he argued that in order to get it from three frames a second to something acceptable and playable, uh, you would need to siphonize the, the code base. So I was really curious about this after watching the talk. Um, and I've been working on a compiler project called Pigeon for the last uh, couple of years. And I was curious to see if I gave it to Pigeon, would Pigeon make it run any faster? And it didn't make much difference. Um, and then I was curious as to why Python was running this so slowly. And when he siphonized things, um, why did it make such a drastic difference? Uh, and basically what I did was go through and refactored a number of things in the application whilst making, keeping it Pythonic, um, but making some very small changes. Uh, and it sped up by four times, um, which is a big difference, but still not enough. Uh, and I thought, okay, that was a reasonably successful project. Uh, an interesting experiment, but maybe I can learn from what I've just done and see if I can apply those same principles to something else, which doesn't need uh, a 30 times performance improvement, it just needs a two or four. So when you think about um, trying to improve the performance of your applications, uh, I like to think of it in terms of two axes. So uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the amount of impact that it has, and across the bottom, you've got the code changes uh, that you would need to make. So I guess the, the most drastic one you could do would be to rewrite, siphonize your, your code um, or write a pure C extension module. So in terms of changes, throwing siphon at it wouldn't make an immediate difference. You'd have to type it as well. So doing type siphon would give you uh, both a dramatic imp improvement in performance, uh, but also require you to make a number of changes. And then on the other side of the graph, we've got the um, the sort of hardware engineer's view of things, which is let's just throw more CPUs at this and more RAM at this. So that doesn't require any code changes uh, and can make a dramatic difference. Um, we then got other approaches, which are uh, mixed. Um, introducing caching tiers is always something that I'd recommend, especially in uh, web applications. And I say tiers like from the front end, from the view, and then you have a caching beneath that, a caching above the database, and maybe even a caching level on the function. Uh, optimizing, optimizing your database calls and any I.O. operations, definitely a classic one. Uh, and also maybe implementing things in PyPy uh, if it's required. Uh, we then got minor version Python upgrades. So moving from 3.8 to 3.9 or 3.9 to 3.10. Uh, each of those normally comes with a 5 to 10% performance incre increase. Uh, 3.11 is looking like a 25% performance gain on 3.10, which is awesome. And then what I want to talk to you about is this last one, which is optimize existing code. And we're going to talk about micro-optimizations to Python code. In, in, is, I guess, flexible as to where that box goes, <laughs> um, because you can make small changes, which is what we're going to talk about. Um, or you can go nuts, and you can just uh, refactor your entire code base. But before you jump in, there's some things you definitely want to do if you're going to think about micro-optimizing. Uh, create a benchmark before you start. So what is the baseline? What is the performance of the application like today? Don't go in there and start making changes unless you know whether it's making things better or worse. Um, when you do run a benchmark, a baseline, um, think about the inputs that you're testing it on. 
Uh, don't just give it dummy data. Uh, try and make it as realistic as possible with what your production app looks like. Um, when you do make changes, try and keep them small and atomic. Um, so don't do a big refactor all at once, uh, because then if you see things slow down in one area and speed up in another, it's hard to figure out what caused that. Um, and then when you are reproducing uh, improvements in speed, you need to do that thousands of times. So just running a one-off benchmark is not normally enough, because uh, CPUs have a lot of noise on them. Um, so things can run slower for absolutely no reason or something outside of your control. Uh, if you don't believe me, look on the Python speed site, and sometimes you see like there was a 2% performance improvement in this commit, and the commit was a change to a markdown file. So there's noise, and you can ignore something like that. Um, also, don't assume that the impact that you're measuring will be the same against minor Python versions. So the stuff I'm showing you today is against Python 3.10, uh, and we've been having fun this week testing it against 3.11 Alpha 7 as well. Uh, so all of the stuff I'm showing you today is relevant to 3.11 as well. And I say also, uh, if you see a performance gain of under 10%, generally don't bother. Uh, so a lot of that is noise, so you can give or take a couple of percent, um, but a 10%, less than 10% performance improvement is really not particularly helpful. Um, and most of the stuff I'll show you is 30, 60, 80% uh, gains. So when I said to benchmark your code first, uh, to do that you need to use a profiler. There are two types of profilers, tracing profilers and sampling profilers. So the first one is a tracing profiler. So the way that works is there is a tracing function, um, which is a custom function that you can write, or you can use one of the, um, the built-in profiling modules, or there's some on PyPI as well. That will run the trace. It will then execute the function, and then it will run the trace. Uh, the pros of this is that it's pretty accurate in terms of measuring how long it took to run the function. Uh, the con, the biggest con is that there's a quite a big overhead. So it's pausing while it runs the profile before it runs your code. A sampling profiler is a bit different. So your code runs and then something in another process um, will periodically sample the uh, Python executable to basically see what is running and what's happening at that time. Some advantages to that are you can be a lot more specific in terms of granularity, and I'll show you um, some profilers in a second. The biggest difference is that the overhead is less. So if we look, um, I put together a list of my favorite profilers, um, and I've highlighted my recommended uh, flavors at the top, which is Austin and Scalene. Um, these are both samplers. Uh, they have a very small overhead, so when you're profiling an application, it should behave pretty much as it would normally without a profiler. Uh, whereas if you run um, C profile sometimes, it, your, your code runs two times slower um, than it would do normally uh, because it's a tracing profiler. Um, the built-in one is C profile, which is brilliant if you're testing uh, alpha versions, like if you're testing 3.11, for example, because it's built into the standard library, it always works. Uh, PyInstrument, PySpy, and Yappy are um, pure Python ones. Instrument and PySpy are great. The difference, I guess, between the, why I've recommended these two at the top is because they can do it at a line level. And if you're doing micro-optimizations, um, often you're going to get a performance report that says most of the time is spent in this function. And you're like, OK, great, but what do I do with that function? I can't just throw it away. I could split it up. Um, but with something like scaling, what you can actually get is this awesome output. Uh, Austin does this as well. Um, it's basically a side-by-side -side, uh, copy of your code, and it will highlight uh, specific lines that took up a lot of memory, a lot of CPU time, um, and it also splits the time between native Python time and C extension time. So you can get a lot of detail. Um, I like using this because in the case of the NES uh, emulator, is basically able to drill down to a set of 10 lines in the entire code base that were causing a lot of the uh, CPU time. So once you've done this um, and you've identified some lines uh, or some loops, um, then we're going to talk about, I guess, what you can do about that. Um, so I've been working on this uh, repository that has the theories that I've got in this talk. Um, so if you don't believe me about any of these and you want to download them and run them yourself, you can do. So it's a GitHub Tony Baloney anti-patterns. And basically what I'll do is uh, have two functions, A and a B. They're functionally equivalent, so they do exactly the same thing, but they've been implemented in slightly different ways. 
uh, and the B function is the one which I think is more efficient. And then on, uh, on the table, you see the mean, and in brackets, the percentage difference. So by applying this, uh, basically by undoing this anti-pattern, you get 65% performance improvement on tiny functions. Um, and I'll go through some of the most important ones. Um, I've also been working on taking these uh, learnings and trying to build them into a linter. This is very much a work in progress. Um, it will raise a ton of false positives on your code. Um, so <laughs> don't put it in the way of CICD. Uh, give it a go and see what it comes up with. Um, I also need more people to have a go at this with their own code bases and tell me what kind of false positives it's bringing up. Um, but I'll show you some examples of uh, what it's doing in a minute. It is a pilot and extension, but you can also run it as a standalone linter by just giving it a directory. Okay, so the first concept we're gonna cover is a big one. Um, if anyone's ever done compiler design or anything like that, uh, you might be familiar with this term, but most people are not. Uh, loop invariance means that there is a, an expression or uh, some instructions within a loop which are invariant which means that the result of that expression does not change with each iteration of the loop. So the example I've got here um, is a function before. Uh, we've got a tuple x, uh, we've got a variable i which is uh, set to six. And then the expression len x multiplied by i is always the same because n never uh, x never changes and i never changes. So what perflint is doing is basically identifying that expression and saying this expression is invariant. Um, what some compilers would do, such as uh, LLVM, GCC, the Go compiler, is they'd identify that statement automatically when you compile the code, and they'd actually move the expression outside of the loop. Uh, this is called loop invariant code motion, or some people call it hoisting. Uh, the Python compiler doesn't do this, um, so you need to do it manually if it's worth it. Uh, and I'll touch on that in a second. So in the after function, this is what you would do to refactor that, which is to create a new variable called xi, or probably something slightly better named, uh, and then to use that inside the loop. That probably looks like a really trivial thing, and it's 55% um, faster. So we're essentially doing the same thing, but we're not running the len x multiplied by i expression for every iteration of the loop. Um, it all, but it breaks two rules. Uh, First of all, it's more code. <laughs> uh, secondly, it's less readable. Um, so it was, it was kind of more obvious before what len x multiplied by i was when you're reading that statement. And let's say this, rain, this loop is massive and you're like 50 lines down. So it might not be that obvious. Um, however, if you run your profiler and you discover there's a particularly hot loop in your code, then you can apply these kind of methods. Um, and you can see this kind of impact. Perflint will actually identify more than just tiny expressions like this. It'll actually pull out entire branches and say this branch is actually invariant, as in it's exactly the same each time. Um, we've been running some benchmarks on the types of expressions that it makes sense to hoist out of your loop. Uh, and they include things like dictionary lookups, uh, method calls, function calls, a um, whole bunch of different things like that, um, which you would think is being cheap things that you can do in Python. Um, but if you're running a hot loop like this, it can make a pretty dramatic difference. So that's number one. Um, number two, and I'm going to introduce my new favorite font, which is Comic Sans Mono. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, this one, we've got our functions A and B. Um, ho hopefully this one's familiar to people. If you're fairly new to Python or you're still getting into the intermediate space, uh, then I'll introduce this one to you. List comprehensions are faster than for loops in this kind of pattern. So where you're taking a list of something and then you're creating another list and filtering the items by some sort of expression, um, it is faster to do that in a list comprehension. It is also less code. It's also more readable. Um, if you're familiar with list comprehensions, you might not be familiar with the um, siblings, uh, such as dictionary comprehensions and set comprehensions. Uh, Perflint, so the linter that I've been working on, will now automatically detect code where you should have used a dictionary uh, or a list comprehension. Um, and this is a quick win. Uh, so this is 23% performance gain uh, for less code. So that's number two. So let's step this up a bit. Um, 
The third one I see quite a lot is that people are using the wrong types uh, for things. So there are lots of data structure types in Python that are built in. Um, and depending on what you want to use them for, uh, you should pick the appropriate type. If you use a type that was not designed for the purpose that you're trying to use it for, it will very likely be inefficient. So for example, if, you're, if you have a collection of values which is constant, uh, and then you loop over them and you uh, subscript that uh, and use a list, uh, that is actually more efficient to use a tuple. Tuple lookups are quicker, tuple creation is quicker than lists. Um, so I put this simple tree together, um, and I'm sure we could expand on this, but um, really you could, the question why is mutability, so do I need to change the information inside this uh, collection? Does it have unique items? Um, and then you could choose between a set, a list, a byte array, um, or, and then if it's, not, if it's immutable, then what are the contents? So they byte string any, and then if it's any, do we need unique on items or not? Uh, there's also memory view under bytes, um, but that's a really niche one. Um, so yeah, this is my simple structure. Um, but that was the simple types. Um, you've then got things like classes, data classes, dictionaries, or named tuples. I was aware of this when I started these benchmarks, but there's a massive difference in performance between all of these. Um, so when you're considering which of these to use, uh, first of all, think about how you're going to use it. So how much mapping are you doing between the source data and your representation in Python? So if you're reading from JSON or you're reading from uh, JSON data from an API, uh, you're then converting that into a list uh, of classes with attributes. So you're doing a mapping function. Uh, and then you're unmapping all of that back out into JSON for your API endpoint. That's super inefficient. Um, so if you look at a lot of the um, ODMs and ORMs, in terms of their efficiency gain, they try and reduce mapping. So how much mapping is there between your source and target data? What operations are you mainly doing uh, with these types? So are you, doing, are you looping over them? Are you mapping them? Are you sorting them? Are you searching them? And it's very likely there's an appropriate type for each of those. So you know, even if you do love data classes, sometimes it's better or more efficient to use something else. Even if you love dictionaries, sometimes it's better to, or more efficient to use something else. It really depends on what you're trying to represent. And then lastly, um, yeah, is the API important? So is what you present back to the consumer of your function or your code important? So dictionaries are brilliant, but if your functions all just return a dictionary um, and you don't document what um, keys it has, it's not particularly helpful to your users, whereas classes obviously can be uh, a lot more strongly typed. So let's jump into an example. So we've got three implementations of the same thing. Um, we've got a, a data class. Um, we've got a name tuple um, or tuple. I still could never decide which pronunciation it's supposed to be. Um, and then also the lesser known one is you can create a class which inherits from typing.nameTuple, which basically does the same thing as the, as the middle one. So those uh, three implementations all do the same thing. Um, any, okay, let's, let's try and split the room. Um, would you think data classes are faster or slower than named tuples? Put up your hand if you think data classes are faster. Okay, there's a couple, yeah. And named tuples are faster, taking you awake, okay, good. Um, this is a uh, class uh, that we can write, which basically does the same thing. Uh, I've just explicitly defined everything. So this basically is the hard way of doing data classes, which is just to write them by hand. Um, would you think that the concrete class is faster than the name tuple? Put up your hand. OK, that's interesting. Um, uh, the concrete class is 51% faster than data class. Probably no surprise. Uh, a lot of the reason for that is actually the overhead of the magic methods in data classes. It's 28% faster than a named tuple. Um, so that might come as a surprise to 99% of you who didn't put your hand up. Um, it breaks two rules, though. It's, it's more code, uh, and it's probably less readable as well. So um, this, is a, this is an interesting one. So I want to push this a bit further and say, OK, uh, hopefully this is readable, but I'll read them out. Um, Python 3.9, tested in 3.10, doesn't make much difference. Uh, 
39 is in green, pi pi 39 is in grayish black. Um, dictionaries are slower than custom classes with slots. That's a weird thing I discovered, number one. Uh, secondly, name tuple is around the same as typing.nameTuple, which was not that surprising. Uh, custom classes, um, and then custom classes with, uh, with slots. There's something wrong there. <laughs> that's wrong. Okay, sorry. Uh, custom classes should be further down, and that's because I tested on 3.10. Um, custom classes are much faster in 3.10. This is a 3.9 graph. Okay, so my apologies. So in 3.10, custom classes will be further down, so they will be the fastest implementation. Um, data classes are significantly slower. Um, I mentioned the magic methods as one of the reasons. Um, however, if you're using, if you've got only a couple of instances of the data class, then don't bother rewriting it as a concrete class, uh, because 51% faster of next to nothing is still next to nothing. Um, but if you're creating hundreds of instances, then it's probably worth considering uh, your structure types. Okay, so that's, um, that's the next pattern. So this, this one I see quite a bit, um, which is people not really understanding how iterables work um, in Python. So here we're defining a tuple of items, and then in the loop we're saying, okay, let's turn that into a list so we can loop over it. Uh, but, you know, a, the tuple iterator is built into tuples, so uh, that's completely unnecessary. Um, and also, it would eagerly iterate it and then create another iterator and iterate it a second time. So it basically does twice as much work to do the same thing. Uh, Perflint has underlined it because it's saying what you're doing is wrong. Um, the next tiny one um, is that if you have a uh, unmutated collection, so you've created a collection of something and you're not changing it, um, don't use the list, use a tuple, um, unless you're leaking that variable out to other functions. 20-ish um, percent faster to create and index, um, and it's a fairly small change. So that's, an, that's a tiny one. Uh, so we're gonna get onto the big one now, which is uh, calling too many functions. Um, so if you're familiar with the acronym DRY, don't repeat yourself. Uh, this is the concept that uh, in your code, you should not write the same code over and over again. Um, and you probably learned this when you learned to, when you learned to program. Um, in some languages, that makes 100% sense. Um, in Python, there's caveats to that. Um, so calling a function, especially a pure Python function, um, has an overhead uh, in Python, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, if you're calling a C function, like a built-in or something that's a C library, there is still an overhead and it's still significant, but it's less. Um, okay, so let's, let's give an example. Um, a and B, and this is the smallest example I could think of. Um, we've made a function called add, which in reality you'd probably never do, but I wanted to just extract the difference uh, as well as possible. So A and B, uh, we're gonna loop 100,000 times um, between uh, over N, and then add x, which is a constant of one to n. So b is 56% faster than a. So the difference between the two is that um, we're not calling a function. So that basically isolates what's the overhead of calling this function. Um, if you um, call the function twice, uh, 65%. Um, if you go even further, then basically it goes up to the point where it hits a, hits a line. So basically, the, the overhead is a function of the number of times that the function is called or the cost of the function. Um, the reason I bring this up is because I see this quite a lot in code where people create a small utility function and they call that in a hot loop. So if you have a hot loop and you've identified what they are when you've been profiling your code, start to think about how you can possibly inline some of those instructions. It's horrible and it creates more code and it's very unpythonic. Um, but if you need to be brutal in some hot areas of your code, um, then this is a sledgehammer uh, that you can use. Um, I've been experimenting with a um, uh, utility library, uh, which I'd love for people to have a go with and to give me some feedback on. Um, the concept is basically that uh, you could put a decorator on a function and um, 
whenever you call that function, the module will basically inline the instructions into the callee, so wherever it was called. Um, this works by doing a, it basically manipulates the source code. So you have to actually give the source file to the script and it will give you the equivalent after the inlining. I don't think there's any plans to have inlining in C Python or in the language. Um, I know that the team are actively working on reducing function call overhead. Uh, this week, we've been doing a lot of testing on uh, 3.11 versus 3.10. So my point about this is still relevant in 3.11. Hopefully in 3.12, uh, that will become less the case. So that was um, point number four. The bonus one I want to bring up, um, which only got discovered um, this morning, is, <laughs> uh, is um, the match statement. So I watched the talk on the match statement this week, which is brilliant. Um, and we were running some benchmarks on um, 3.11 to compare the match statement uh, with the equivalent of Python code. And for sequences, it's 80% faster. The match statement is 80% faster for sequences. For mappings, it wasn't. But then I nerd sniped uh, Brant Butcher, uh, and he was up till 3 AM working on the code base, and he has fixed that. And once it's merged, it will be 80% faster. And if that can get merged into 3.11 before the beta date, then there's a new rule, which is use match statements, because they're significantly faster for both sequences and mappings. So let's wrap this up. Um, so we're looking for four, these four anti-patterns that I've raised in the talk. These are not the only ones, um, but it's really the biggest ones I've seen, the ones with the biggest impact. Uh, loop invariance as a concept, it's really important if you can understand that as, as a developer. Um, doing a subscript on a, on a dictionary, so doing a dictionary key lookup, uh, is, a, is a statement that is invariant in a lot of cases if the dictionary hasn't changed. Um, so look for these in your code. Uh, utilize comprehensions when and where you can. Uh, very importantly, make sure you're selecting the right data type. Um, and also consider the, the overheads of data types, but also the APIs of the data types that you're using. Um, and avoid tiny functions in caveat in hot code. Tiny functions are great and they create clean code, utility functions. However, if you're using it in a loop, which is getting slammed millions of times, then you want to micro-optimize that, then I'd recommend looking at maybe inlining some of those. The method that I showed you is hoisting, where you basically just assign that expression to a variable, a local variable, and then just refer to that variable in the loop. Um, but before you do any of this, make sure you've set up some sampling, you've sampled your code correctly, and you understand how your application performs, and you know which are the areas of your code, uh, which are the areas of your program which are causing most of the execution time. So don't just go and apply this principle blindly to all of your code base. Perflint will give you input across everything. Uh, it will tell you that you should optimize your test functions, and it will tell you all sorts of stuff. But you need to apply common sense to that as a developer and combine that with profiling. So say, OK, let's focus on this part of our code, because we think we can make this 50% faster, this, just this function. But if that uses up 80% of our execution time, then potentially you've just quadrupled your execution performance. So focus on the areas that matter. Uh, track regressions if you can. So if you can introduce a tool to measure performance between commits, um, that also makes a difference. There's a PyTest extension for doing benchmarking, uh, which is great. Um, and also talk to your team about some of these ideas and some of these principles. So if you can catch it in code review, um, you can avoid performance regressions uh, in the future. Uh, and then lastly, to wrap it up, um, there's my website. There's my Twitter handle. I wrote a book on the CPython compiler called CPython Internals. Um, and so make sure you check that out. I've also got loads of socks, um, which is probably the most important thing. So if you want a pair of socks, we've got some really nice socks. They're not these ones, though. These are from PyCon APAC, and they're awesome. Um, so I have loads of socks at the front. Thank you for my coming to my talk. If you have any comments or any feedback or anything and you want to try out Perflint, please catch me outside after the talk and I'd be happy to chat. Thanks, everybody.